Um, thank you again. This next session will be about uh, uh, managing heritage. And we have three presenters, and what I'd like to do is have, uh, I'll introduce them as they speak, but if we could hold uh, questions for the end, uh, we should have some time before lunch. So our first uh, speaker is Braden Cannon. Braden is uh, a colleague of mine at the Provincial Archives of Alberta. He holds a Master of Library and Information Studies degree from Dalhousie University, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Film Studies from Carleton. His research interests include community archives, indigenous archives, and community engagement. And that's what he's going to talk about today, uh, is preserving communities. Thank you, Brayden. Thank you, uh, good morning. Uh, so, I'm gonna be talking about this project I did 10 years ago when I was a grad student at Dow in Halifax. And um, Irene assures me that it's still a useful thing. It's still, um, being used and of interest, so I, I hope you agree, and not just me reliving past glories or anything like that. Um, so, I, I wanted to undertake this project uh, because I, I saw the importance of, of community organizations, specifically like really kind of grassroots, um, horizontal, extremely democratic, uh, to put it politely, uh, organizations that may not have very long histories, but in, when they are active, they are very impactful. And these kinds of organizations can come and go quickly, in, especially in urban settings. Um, so I wanted to do some research with some local groups at the time and see what kinds of records management uh, programs they had in place, what kinds of archival programs they had in place, or if they had put any thought into these as, at all, which is kind of a, a rhetorical question, um, and see how I could help uh, preserve their, their history, preserve their community in, in, some, in some way. So uh, community organizations are a fundamental element of our society and are responsible for a number of initiatives that have a wide impact on social life at many levels. Um, but these initiatives will have the greatest long-term impact only if properly documented and represented in archival holdings. However, a problem exists in that many community organizations are unaware of the long-term importance of their records, are unfamiliar with archival procedures, and have no sense of where their records can be donated to or how to prepare records for deposit. Uh, the activities of grassroots community organizations are often underrepresented in archives due to several factors, including said organization's lack of resources to devote to proper archival procedures, the transitory nature of many grassroots organizations, and perhaps unwillingness of archivists to devote time and energy to documenting this segment of society. For these reasons, it's important for community organizations to receive help with preservation of their records, either through donation of records to an appropriate archive or the creation of in-house archives, and to participate in the archival process. With this in mind, I undertook a research project during my second year of my Master of Library and Information Studies coursework to ascertain the unique issues and viewpoints of community organizations in regards to their archival records. The second part of this research project was to create a guide which would address these issues and offer practical advice to members of community organizations wanting to preserve their records. Uh, the project was run out of the School of Information Management at Dalhousie University in Halifax and completed over the course of two academic terms from 2008 to 2009 with the guidance of Dr. Catherine Harvey, formerly of the Dalhousie University Archives and Special Collections. Uh, now she's at the University of Guelph Archives. And um, Susan McClure, who's the Municipal Archivist of the Halifax Regional Municipality. So for the purposes of the project, community organization is defined as a non-profit, non-governmental organization run by community members on a grassroots level based in the locality of the research project, Halifax, and primarily serving the needs of that community. Uh, the organizations that I worked with were uh, the Robert Street Social Center, the Halifax Cycling Coalition, and the Ecology Action Center. These organizations were selected for several reasons. Chief among these were the variety of focal points and goals, disparate organizational structures, differences in length of activity in the community, differences in the types and amounts of records produced, and the various sizes of the organizations. Each of the selected organizations offered different examples of the above criteria while also being representative of a specific kind of organ community organization, grassroots in nature and very, very process-oriented. 
Secondary reasons for selecting these organizations included my ability to work with them as defined by logistical concerns, such as the location and size of the organization, the expressed desire of the organization to participate, and contacts that I had with some of the organizations which eased the selection process. The Ecology Action Center was the first group that was approached, as its nearly 40-year history, status in the province, wide range of activities, large pool of volunteers and staff members, and extensive creation and use of records made it a prime candidate. The Ecology Action Center was eager to participate as they had recently and independently engaged in some internal discussion regarding what to do with their inactive records. Conversely, the Halifax Cycling Coalition was approached because it is a much younger organization and would naturally have been quite different record situation. While the Cycling Coalition was not as large as the Ecology Action Center, it, does, it did have a, an active executive and large pool of volunteers, and its record of activity has been, had been strong in its brief history. Beyond this, I wanted to see what kind of emerging records management issues a young community organization would have and how they would be able to instill good record keeping habits from nearly the beginning of their creation. The Robert Street Social Center is perhaps the most unique organization that I worked with. While the other organizations are issue oriented, the Robert Street Social Center exists to provide a space for the creation of independent media and arts, a zine library, meetings of other various community organizations and endeavors, workshops on a host of topics, and a studio for screen printing. Because of this, the Robert Street Social Center is particularly process-oriented and presented a unique example of the challenges faced when attempting to apply archival theory to a group whose primary purpose cannot be succinctly or effectively understood solely through their records. <coughs> Once the three organizations had confirmed their participation and I had received research approval from the School of Information Management's Ethics Committee, I proceeded to interview several representatives from each organization, particularly those with a high degree of involvement in the organization, intimate knowledge of their organization's goals and pro projects, and its record-creating functions. Using a series of questions devised with the assistance of my academic supervisors, I was able to gather information about each organization, what its purpose is, how it operates, what records are created, who creates the records, how the records are used, and how the records are managed. Furthermore, I was able to get an understanding of how members of these organizations view archives and whether or not they feel that their organization is worth having its memory preserved. This was a fascinating aspect to the project, which greatly influenced how the final guide was created and why emphasis in the guide was placed on the importance of preserving their records. For instance, one question from the interview asked, do you think it important that the memory of your organization's work be preserved? Each respondent paused and contemplated when confronted with this question. Answers ranged from the emphatic yes, although that was actually a less likely answer, to the more likely response of, I had never thought of that, uh, but I suppose it would be nice to have our work remembered or some variation of that. To the outright no, it doesn't really matter. Uh, while this last answer was definitely not the most common, it did provide insight into a mindset that is more concerned with the work being done today and with the processes of how that work gets done. By that thinking, everything else is secondary. So just like Myron was talking about in his earlier uh, presentation, uh, many of these organizations were only thinking about today and tomorrow. And the history of the legacy of their organization or their work and endeavor really never crosses their mind. Um, and that was pretty prevalent with all three of the organizations that I, I worked with, and especially because they were all activist in approach. Um, particularly the Ecolo Ecology Action Center and the Halifax Cycling uh, Coalition were focused on, um, to some degree, lobbying of provincial and municipal governments, uh, trying to enact new bylaws or provincial legislation uh, so the focus was always on what could be done today, what could be done now. The interviews also ascertained the level of understanding of and experience with archives among individual members of the groups. Again, experience with archives varied from being mostly unaware of the purpose of archives to being quite familiar and experienced with archives and archival research. Beyond that line of questioning, the interviews mostly focused on issues related to the creation, use, and management of records. Responses from these questions provided a firm understanding of the functions and processes of the organization, making it easier to appraise records based on functional analysis and macro appraisal concepts. Don't worry about that stuff. That's just you know, archival theory. Um, so after completion of the interviews, I was able to conduct a summary records survey and on-site records appraisal for each organization. Because of the smaller size of the Halifax Cycling Coalition and the Robert Street Social Center, I was able to survey the majority of their records while I was only able to survey the broad cross-organizational records of the Ecology Action Center, and not necessarily the records created, used, and stored by individual staff members within the organization. 
However, I was able to survey all of the Ecology Action Center servers, which did include subfolders for each staff member. Because I was able to collect so much information in the interview stage, the record surveys were quite efficient and served mostly to confirm hypotheses derived from the interview stage. The surveys were conducted on computers, in basements, in boxes tucked away in corners, and in every drawer or cabinet where textual records could be hidden away. While conducting these surveys, I paid particular attention to what kind of records were created, when the records were created and by whom, how the records were used, if the records were archival, if the membership had a different concept of what was archival, and how the records were stored, named, filed, and accessed. I then confirmed this information with the extensive notes I had taken with all the interview participants and identified key challenges based on the participant organizations. The results from this process were then used to formulate the final guide produced and published at the end of the project. Uh, the unique obstacles affecting community organizations and any possible attempts to preserve their records can be categorized under four divisions. Personnel, funding, records management, and awareness of archives. The preeminent personnel issue for the participant organizations is turnover. The organizations often rely on volunteers with varying levels of commitment and paid staff is often laid off due to funding difficulties or they lead to seek other in, uh, opportunities. This high degree of turnover is greater than other organizational sectors and leads to a constant loss of group memory. This in turn leads to constant reinventing of the wheel and duplication of past efforts amongst organization members as there is no corporate memory to learn from. Furthermore, volunteers and paid staff faced with huge workloads and unstable sources of income often burn out and drift away from the organization. In cyclical fashion, this burnout is a direct source of turnover. Those members who do stay with the organizations for longer periods of time come to be seen as bedrock members and a large degree of dependence is placed on them. These members are often the most active and knowledgeable, but often want to step back from their positions as the pressure can be overwhelming. If these members do in fact step away, they take with them a large amount of organizational knowledge and memory, and their function within the organization is often irreplaceable as no one else can or is willing to step in. Because so much of the work done by members is volunteered, members are under no obligation to take on more responsibilities when needed. Along with turnover and burnout, varying degrees of members' commitment cannot be overemphasized as functional dilemmas for these community organizations. The last significant personnel problem is the fact that current staff and volunteers are usually overstretched and therefore unable to undertake any sort of effort toward records management or preservation of records. None of the participant organizations currently have uh, had a designated records manager or archivist. Even when the importance of records keeping is acknowledged, a feeling of inability due to practical constraints pervades and must be contended with. And of the three organizations, only the Ecology Action Center actually had any paid staff at all. Uh, funding is a consistent and ever present issue for all of the participant organizations, though a group with a firm mission like the Ecology Action Center has more access to funding avenues than a more loosely organized and nebulously defined group like the Robert Street Community Center, or Social Center rather. Nonetheless, it is a constant struggle for each of the participant organizations to sustain current funding levels, let alone to gain further funding. Because of this, a large amount of energy is devoted to fundraising, which relates again to burnout and personnel issues. In each case, the most active and overworked members were also responsible for funding. This is not always part of their prescribed duties, but is often taken on because no one else in the organizations would or could. Similarly to personnel problems, the participant organizations often do not have enough funds for current projects and so are unable to put money toward archival or records management projects or training in this area. Any consideration given to the preservation of community organizations' records must include these funding dilemmas. Then there's records management. Uh, none of the participant organizations had any records management policies, procedures, or official practices whatsoever. The organizations uh, did not use naming conventions, systematic filing, retention schedules, or secure file storage for either electronic or hard copy records. For the participant organizations that have existed for more than a few years and have accumulated and created large amounts of records, this led to a raft of problems such as scattering of records, uh, both on site but also in the homes of the individual members, missing records, duplication of records, little to no control over email, other digital records, little awareness of large amounts of records in existence or whether or not certain records still exist. And the longer an organization had been active and the more staff and volunteers had rotated through, the more exacerbated these problems had become. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what little storage they did have for records was also often pretty 
tenuous. Uh, the Ecology Action Center had a rainwater recycling pool in their basement, and big surprise, their what little archives they did have was right next to their open rain collection pool. <laughs> uh, um, and the last subject of inquiry was awareness of archives, archivists, and archival issues collectively held by members of the participant organizations. Uh, through these interviews, several tendencies emerged. Most of the interview subjects had absolutely no personal experience with archives, were unsure of what archivists do or the function of archives, and did not know that records could be donated to an archive. Um, Beyond that, like I said earlier, they expressed little interest in creating a historical record, didn't look too far into the future, or think about the past too much. Although some individual members did have interest in historic legacy and, and made attempts at long-term preservation. Um, but when that was the case, there was confusion about what records were actually archival, what had enduring value, and what was more transitory in nature. Um, so in creating the final guide, these attitudes held by organization members toward archives and long-term preservation discovered through the interviews were the most challenging for me to address and overcome. I found that the best way to convince organization members, especially the longer serving ones, that preservation of their records is worthwhile was to point out that the archives could become part of their activist process by educating current and future members about what projects have been undertaken, which projects were successful and which were not, which projects could be tweaked and tried again, which projects should never be resurrected. By using the archives, either in-house or external in this manner, I feel that community organizations could reduce burnout amongst members, refrain from constantly reinventing the wheel through lack of organizational memory, and reduce stress and pressure on the key members. This line of argument was eye-opening to most of the interview participants and was carried into the final product, which was a guide um, that I called Preserving Communities, and it was made available as a PDF on the Halifax Municipal Archives website, which is what I've got up here. Uh, so this is the website, um, you probably can't see the actual address there, but if you go to the, just do a Google search for the Halifax Municipal Archives website, there is a link for donating the records, and then follow that to here, or you could just do a Google search for preserving communities in Halifax, you probably find it, and the, the PDF is here. Now, this is the, the original guide that I made 10 years ago, um, could probably stand for some updates, um, but I haven't been in touch with Susan, the Halifax Municipal Archivist, to, to talk about that, but it's uh, now as good a time as any. Um, but it is, like I said, available as a PDF there, and it's a, I try to make it as succinct as possible, um, very compact and easy to understand guide to preserving records of, of community organizations, either in-house or explaining the process of how to donate records to an established archives. Um, I, didn't use a lot of archival terminology that wouldn't make much sense to community members, and I tried to really focus it on the concerns that I discovered through the interview process and try to address those and bring that out. Um, I've had a lot of good feedback. Uh, when I first published it, there's uh, uh, various archival associations, like the Association of Canadian Archivists kind of picked up on it and helped disseminate it. And it's gone out into the world, and Irene tells me that uh, she's helped spread the word and has gotten good, good feedback from it as well. So um, I encourage anybody who has questions about all things related to archives and community records to, to have a look at that. And of course, I'll be available for questions afterwards and uh, at lunch as well. So that's pretty much it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Braden. Uh, next is uh, Krista Jamison. She holds a Master of Archival and Information Studies degree from McGill University and a Master of Arts from University of Amsterdam. She's currently also a PhD student at the University of Alberta in the Department of History and the School of Library and Information Studies. She works as the digital archivist for the University of Alberta and she will discuss digital archives and the key needs for preservation and access to digital records. Screen. Hello, thank you. Um, as Tom said, I'm the digital archivist for the University of Alberta. Um, my name is Krista Jamison, and today my talk is going to be on digital archiving, and it's called Digital Archiving a Reality Check. Um, digital archiving is much more complicated um, than I think a lot of people think uh, when they initially think about it, if they think about it at all. Um, so I'm here to talk about some of the details of that. 
Um, so today my talk, uh, first we're going to talk about uh, what comes after digitization. A um, little bit about digital preservation, a thing called an OAIS model, which I'll explain, um, and then sort of the, the conclusion um, reality check aspects of, of key areas. So we know that there are certain magnetic carriers for, uh, or certain media carriers for various information that is deteriorating. There are certain things that just are not going to last a particularly long time. They do better and last longer in certain storage conditions, etc. cetera. Um, but certain types of media just are deteriorating. Sometimes it's newspapers that are falling apart. Sometimes it's a real to reel audio tape from the 1960s that was stored in somebody's basement in very humid conditions. And that tape is very quickly becoming something that you cannot play anymore. Um, so if we want to capture the content from those materials, we have to digitize them. But then what? Um, so my biggest uh, takeaway from this is that this is the beginning, not the end. Um, digitizing something solves one problem and creates 10 more. So things that we need to think about after digitization is where are we going to store those files? What happens if the USB stick that you put it on it gets lost? What happens if that external hard drive, uh, you plug it in one day and it has failed and it has crashed and you don't have those files anymore? Um, what if you drop the thing or it gets wet? Um, water is a huge problem for physical records, but it's, as I'm sure some of you have known who've ever dropped your phone in water, um, that digital things don't like water either, and water is very common um, for lots of different reasons. Um, so also, how will you make it accessible? How are you going to reuse it again? How are other people going to reuse it? If you're digitizing something so that other people can use your research or look at your research or the information that you've gathered, um, they need to be able to have access to it as well, and you having it on you know, a hard drive in your, in your office on a bookshelf isn't helping them have access to it. So how do we actually provide that access to different people? Um, there's also issues of, of losing track of where the original copy is, having duplicate copies. Um, somebody, you know, if you lend somebody the, the USB stick or the hard drive or you give them the web address for, for where you have it stored and they don't realize that that's the only copy and then they delete it, <laughs> that could be a really big problem and all of a sudden you've lost all of this work that you've put into digitization of something. If you've gotten rid of the original media, maybe it's gone altogether. You don't want that to happen, trust me. Um, you also need to pay attention to, for that access aspect, for all of the rights management stuff. Whose intellectual property is this? Whose copyright is this? Irene's going to talk about this next, so you'll hear a bit more about that. But these are also things that you need to pay attention to. Um, you can't necessarily just put something on YouTube um, and be like, well, now it's available and everyone can see it. It might not belong on YouTube. YouTube might not be a good place for it. Um, and lastly, and this is probably one of the biggest issues, is will you still be able to access those files in the future? Computers change a lot. Um, there's plenty of computer files from 10 years ago, let alone 20, 30, and 40 years ago, that you cannot open anymore. We do not have the software to open those files anymore. And this matters for the future. Will you be able to open those files still in five years? Maybe, probably, you have a, you know, a pretty high chance. In 20 years? Probably not for lots of different reasons. So when we're talking about digitally archiving things, we have a few different needs that we need to pay attention to. So the first is storage. Where are we going to put the files? The next is security. We need to make sure that those files don't get hacked, that they don't get a virus, that somebody doesn't try to purposely vandalize those records digitally, which does happen. Um, if you've ever talked to an IT person about the, um, the number of attempts that people make on your files and against your firewall, the numbers can be astronomically high. I definitely had my eyes open when I talked to my IT person about my database, and he was like, yep, we had 800 attempts at breaking this firewall for your database in the last 12 hours, and this is when it first went live. And I was like, holy cow. <laughs> um, not all of them are malicious. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Some of them are just things that exist on the web that are trying to crawl everything all of the time. But that is something you need to, to care about and pay attention to. You can't just put it on an unsecure server. It will probably get something wrong with it. There's also the physical aspect of this. Um, so all, no matter where you put your file, that exists somewhere physical. Every single website exists on a server. 
Um, and so you need to make sure that that is also safe uh, security wise, that nobody can break into it. Nobody can physically damage it. If you take a hammer to a computer server, it's not gonna work anymore. Um, you also need to make sure that it's protected from environmental issues as well. So you don't want your only copy, even if you do have backups, to be sitting next to each other because if that building catches on fire or there's a flood, um, then they're both gone. So physical distance between backups is also something to think about. Um, so all these are sort of physical security type of issues. We also have preservation, which I'm gonna get into more. So this is just a very, very brief overview. So you have the bit level. So this is like the actual digital file. Um, are all of the ones and zeros that make up that digital file still there? And then there's also something called renderability. So can you still open it and does it still look right? There's also all the discovery and access stuff. So this is, can people find it and can they actually look at it and open it? Um, just because you've put something online, I'm sure you've all experienced when you're Googling for something and you know it's there, you've seen it before, somebody's shown it to you, and you can't find it. Even though you're like, you know exactly what it's called, it's just not coming up for some reason. That is the discoverability of something. So can people actually locate it when they're looking for it, even if they know what they're looking for, let alone if they don't know what that, that that's what they're looking for. They're just looking for something on the same topic of, as your material. Um, this also includes things like describing your stuff, which we call metadata, but metadata is a scary word. So um, how you describe your stuff, is it is it labeled? Is it just called like image one? I can't tell you how many times that I have, you know, looked at a computer server and there's, you know, the folder is, is labeled like Krista's computer and then there's 30 different image one. That's not helping anybody to find your stuff. Um, so labeling things appropriately, knowing information about them, having that recorded so people can identify stuff by, by what it is, by who said it, etc. Um, all the things about rights, so who owns it, do you have a right to be putting this online or is this need to be somewhere a bit more secure digitally? Um, the copyright, privacy, are you putting something out there that could uh, lead to somebody having their identity stolen, for example? You can't put things like social insurance numbers, um, or birth dates or employment histories just freely available online if you don't own that information. Somebody else can do it for themselves. It's a risk that people have to make individually. You cannot do that for other people. Okay, so I said I was gonna talk about digital preservation a little bit more um, because this is the aspects of things that um, a lot of the things that I was just talking about can be solved with physical, more practical things that you can really control. So recording information about something, making sure that your server room is like locked, that you have a backup in a different place, so that if there's you know some sort of environmental disaster that it's not just gone. All those are things that you can control on a really like physical, personal level, and you can see them, you know that they're happening, you know that you need to, to do these things. Digital preservation is much more invisible and it's much more, um, it's sometimes difficult to predict, which is sort of the problem. Like we didn't know 20 years ago where computers were gonna go. We don't know now 100% where computers are gonna go. We don't know if a file I create today is just gonna be able to be totally fine um, in 50 years from now or if it's gonna be the same problems as 50 years ago. We're not sure. So the two different um, aspects of this that I talked about, I mentioned before, is the bit level. So is all the bits and bytes that make up a, a digital file um, still there? And then the renderability. Can we open it and does it look right? Now, in order to render something properly, we need to have all of those bits and bytes in place. Sometimes one bit missing doesn't make any difference at all. Sometimes it's like scratching a CD and all of a sudden the whole thing won't read anymore. And there is no way of knowing which one's which. So for the bit level preservation, um, a lot of this is, has to do with the integrity of it and the physical storage of it. So the integrity is making sure that when you digitize something, that getting from there to where you're permanently gonna be storing it, then nothing is lost in that transfer process. If anybody here has ever put a file on a USB stick, tried to open that file later and it just didn't work for no reason, that's what I'm talking about. Sometimes things get lost or lost in the transfer process and making sure that everything that you meant to put in is actually there is really important. You also need to make sure that it stays being there um, when it's in storage. Storage media are not just static things. Every time you back something up, every time you need to... Um, put in a new server, for example, in my physical security subsection. Um, on this slide, I have hardware failures. 
Um, there's a certain percentage of all storage software that will just fail. It's not a very big percentage, but if you're talking about you know 1% even, depending on how much volume you have, that could impact your stuff. Um, so you need to make sure that that sort of ongoing preservation is still there, that ongoing integrity of your files is still there, no matter where it's stored, no matter um, how many times it's been backed up, or no matter how many times you've done other preservation actions, which I'll talk about next. Um, one of the scarier parts about this is a thing called bit rot. Um, and so that is when your computer file drops some of those ones and zeros. And sometimes it's because of the storage it's on, sometimes it's because the room was too humid, sometimes something rusted, sometimes um, when it copied, it just didn't copy properly and you like, lose ones and zeros here and there. Um, and as I said, sometimes it doesn't matter and sometimes it matters a lot. Um, sometimes it also happens for reasons that we don't understand. Sometimes it just happens and there is no rhyme or reason to it, it just does. And this is big and scary sometimes um, in the digital world, but this is why we keep backups, this is why you do all of those backing stuff up, having multiple copies. Um, we usually, in, in digital preservation, you actually want three copies, not just two. Um, so to have them, to have multiple ones that you can check against one another so that you can replace the copies that are, are damaged. So that renderability aspect, so, so you do have all of your ones and zeros still there. Maybe in, in 10 years and 20 years, your ones and zeros are all still there, you've done everything you could, and it worked which is great. Now you still need to be able to open those files. Um, this is, uh, is based on two things, so both the, opera the um, operating systems, so what um, computer do you have? Are you using a Windows? Are you using a Mac? Is that a Windows 95 or a Windows you know, 2008? The different software versions, um, are you using a WordPerfect file? Are you using a, a Word file? Is it from 1995? Is it from 2018? Um, those, just because it's something has the same file extension doesn't mean that it's the same software or the same software version. So if I have a, a .doc file, which is just a, a regular Microsoft Word file, um, it may look in my computer browser exactly the same. Maybe I have four of them and they all look exactly the same in, in terms of what their um, file extension is. But some of those may be too old and the system, when I open it or I try to open it, you get all those symbols. Has that ever happened to anyone? Yeah. Um, that's it not being able to read. Sometimes it just like looks weird. The way it puts the file back together just doesn't read properly. Um, and that's partially to do with the structure of the object. The way that the computer has recorded that information has changed over time and it changes in different file formats and different media types. So putting back together certain um, Word files isn't that difficult for a computer to do. It knows um, how it recorded all the different letters. It knows the order that those letters came in. Putting back together, say, a video is significantly more complicated than that. Um, you have every single frame has pixels that need to go in a certain order. The frames need to go in a certain order and you need to line up sound to that, which is all very complicated. Um, and those things are, that structure of the file can make a really big difference as well. If you, if you have a computer that can read all the individual parts but can't put them back together, that's also not gonna look right. Um, so there's three different approaches that are sort of standard in digital preservation, and they're often used together. Typically people use at least two of these things at the same time. Um, so the first approach is called normalization, which is instead of having 10 different file formats, um, when you're first getting them to put them all into one file format. Because then instead of having to worry about Word 95 and Corral and Claris Works, if anybody's an old Mac user, um, say you have all those different files, transferring them all to one file format. So instead of having to worry about five different file formats, you only have to worry about one. That's step number one, often, um, but that's one of the approaches. The second approach is migration. So to keep updating things, which is really easy when you have one file or 10 files. It gets really difficult to do when you're talking about thousands of files. Um, but that's keeping things up to date so that everything is in the latest and newest file format and, and operating system format so that you can continue to open those things on an ongoing basis. The third is something called emulation. And this is basically making a digital environment that replicates an older environment. 
So they have them for video games online, if any of you have seen these before, which are kind of fun. Um, but they recreate old systems. So it's like setting up on your computer so that the file thinks that your computer is a Windows computer from 1995. I don't know why that's my example for everything today. Um, but so your computer is acting as if it's a Windows computer from 1995 with Microsoft on it. And so then you can open up those files, even though you would not be able to open them up with a modern um, computer and, and software set. And so these things are often done in conjunction. Normalization is typically um, the first step, but then you have to decide how many different files are, are you going to normalize to. Um, and then migration and emulation, it depends what you're doing for what's the best option for it. Um, emulation is quite expensive, but so is everything else, unfortunately. So this is the point that, I, that is big and scary and I can't emphasize enough at the same time. Preservation is ongoing forever. You can't just stop. You don't get to do this once and then be like, but I preserved it already. You have to keep doing it indefinitely, which is why I said at the beginning, digitization is the start and it solves one problem and creates 10 more. This is very costly. This is very time consuming. This is very technical sometimes. Um, but there's also isn't a heck of a lot of other options. If you're talking about paper records, you know, we can find a book from 500 years ago and then that book is still, you can still open the book and read the pages. If you have a punch card from the 1960s, there aren't computers that can still read that. We have absolutely no idea what's on those cards a lot of the time. Um, so then how, how do we do this? How do we manage this? What do we do? So, as I said before, I would explain what this was. So the OAAS model, which is called, uh, stands for the Open Archives Information System, is a framework that the International Council of Archives has developed. And um, this framework basically tells you how all these different aspects fit together to answer all of those questions that I was talking about and bringing up. It doesn't give you a specific software. It doesn't have specific requirements. Um, it's just explaining the things that you need to pay attention to and then the things that you need to make sure that you have covered going forward. So the different steps that are involved in this, so to explain that diagram. Um, uh, so first we have the, the ingest. Um, which has its own standard, but this is about making sure that you have everything that was meant to be either donated to your archive or if you got it digitized, you have everything that was digitized. All the files are still there, everything works, there wasn't any problems in the transfer. Um, the What I call the preparation stage is sort of doing all of that um, recording information about what you have, who, who it belongs to, um, all that descriptive stuff, uh, all the paperwork that's required so that you actually understand what you have. Um, the processing is both that preservations part and the metadata in terms of knowing what those operating systems were, knowing how big your file was, knowing what, um, what file format it is, all of those, that sort of technical information about your file so that will help you with your preservation. Then your storage, so where are you going to put it um, to account for things like hardware failure, backups, um, to security, environmental issues, stuff like that. And then the access side. Um, so making sure that it's somewhere that people can access it, that you can actually find it if you're looking for it, um, but also that you're not violating other people's privacy and copyright. So this is all very big and scary, and I'm very aware of that. Um, this is not easy. This is incredibly complicated and incredibly difficult. As far as I'm aware, um, no one in Canada has actually gotten this entirely up and running and implemented it at a scale that can accommodate thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of records. Lots of people have little parts of it done that are really great. Um, and there's definitely approaches and softwares that are out there that are, it's really about pulling together the right combination for what you're doing. Um, some places using a cloud-based storage like Google Drive or um, can't even think of what the other ones are called. Um, using like a cloud-based storage is perfect for you. Other times putting things online, like putting them on YouTube and, and giving that preservation aspect to Google to manage um, is, is perfect for you. Other times it's not and you need the more local solution. Um, and being able to tell that is sort of, uh, is the important part is being able to figure out what's appropriate for what, you're what records you have. So the reality check of this is that 
Metadata, that descriptive element, is of utmost importance. I cannot stress this enough. <laughs> knowing what you have, knowing what it is, knowing what it is technically as well as what it is content-wise is so important. Um, you also can't outsource all of this. You can't, well, for archives anyway. Um, if you're donating your stuff to an archive, then you are giving this, um, this problem to somebody else. But for archives, we cannot outsource this problem. There's certain services and companies that will do parts of it, but managing those records, um, that descriptive aspect, that discovery aspect, that's the part that we absolutely have to do. Nobody else can manage it for us. Um, there are systems that can do some a lot of that digital preservation, which is the more technically complicated side of things, but that sort of um, intervention archivist side of things can't be outsourced. And my other piece of advice is plan for this before you digitize. Don't digitize everything and then go, now what? You need to know about this beforehand. It's a lot easier to think about a lot of this beforehand so that when you get it digitized, you get it digitized into uh, the proper file format, that you get it digitized into a file format that an archive is going to be able to preserve um, in that normalization step, for example. Um, and finally, digitization is not the end of your concerns. It's not the end of the road. It's just the beginning. It's not the solution to preservation problems. It creates 10 other preservation issues. Um, they just change. Instead of worrying about magnetic media um, getting stuck together or, or having too much dirt on it or whatever, now you're worried about your computer dropping your, your files or them corrupting, not having the right operating system, et cetera. Um, and it's not cheap. This is an indefi indefinite ongoing cost for storage. Storage isn't free. Um, that intervention for preservation isn't free. Um, maintaining that access is something that you have to keep doing over and over and over again. All we can do is preserve things for the next few years and then you have to do it again. And so this isn't, this isn't the end, um, unfortunately. I wish it was. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's very uh, ongoing. That digital preservation is ongoing forever is something I can't emphasize enough. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
as to which records to acquire, how and what can be copied, how long, and if restrictions apply um, on records to protect privacy. This in turn may also provide points of discussion with the donor on whether there are any privacy issues, um, how to manage these privacy issues, and how best to make records available while still complying with the laws. Things may become complicated as records pass from creator to donor or donor to the archives and then are used and interpreted by researchers. Balancing the need to respect intellectual property rights and an individual's privacy and providing access to documentary heritage is a tension that is constant for archivists. Some of these can be addressed by educating oneself on the issues and doing due diligence when dealing with donors and researchers. Let's put things into context and consider. People create <coughs> records with the purpose of dealing with issues in the present, documenting an event or experiences to be able to remember details or discussions. Almost no one creates records solely for the purpose of depositing them in an archive. Donors of, archives, donors of records to an archive are creators of the records, but they also receive records in the course of their business or personal life. For example, letters, articles, photos, sound records, business or government documents can usually be found in and among records that they themselves created. These may be part of the records that end up in an archive as part of a donor's phone. In addition to having records in their phone there are, that are created by someone else, these creators the, of the other stuff may not realize that the records they created have ended up in an archive. Archivists must ensure that the donors have the right to deposit these records, also asking questions about who owns copyright on the records and if there are any privacy issues that need to be addressed in the phone are questions that are better asked and discussed at the beginning of the process rather than at the end when a researcher is already trying to publish an article and you're trying to scramble to make sure that all of these bases are covered. Sometimes simply asking the donor will give you the answer. Sometimes the archivist must do a little bit of research on this. Even though the donor owns the physical records, they may not own the rights to the intellectual property, for example, of the letters written to them, articles copied, or photos of an event that they are in. It is, an important and makes it, it is important and makes life easier if at the point of donation or close to it, the archivist has the conversation with the donor on who owns the copyright, or at the very least, who wrote the letter or the article, who took the photograph, when and where. Negotiating the transfer of copyright to the archives where applicable in the donor agreement would make things much easier because it allows the archives to manage the process of copyright and privacy concerns without involving the donor each time the records are accessed. And that can be onerous, or not, depending on how important or how interesting they are. Let's take a step back and deconstruct some of the issues pertaining to copyright to better understand what steps may be taken to deal with them ahead of time. Copyright, literally, copyright means the right to copy. The Canadian Copyright Act grants copyright owners the sole and exclusive right to reproduce, perform, or publish a work that they have created. These rights give copyright holders control over the use of their creations and the ability to benefit monetarily and otherwise from the exploitation of these works. In addition, moral rights, which is also in copyright, protect the reputation of the creators. The rights are subject to specific limitations as set out in various provisions of the Copyright Act. To be considered a work, where a work can mean literary, artistic, dramatic, musical work, computer programs, performances, sound recordings, and communication signals. The, the work must meet three criteria. It must be original, it must be fixed to some sort of media, whether it's paper, film, sound recording, digital. The author must be a citizen or a resident of Canada at the time that they create the work. In Canada, copyright does not have to be registered. The creator of a work becomes the copyright owner automatically once the work is fixed in some way onto a media that is permanent. Sometimes this is complicated when the copyright is transferred 
like in publication um, situations, the publisher has the copyright uh, or is, has rights to it and so on. Uh, having copyright of a work is different than owning a the physical item. You can own a book, but you do not have the right to copy the book without the author's permission. You can copy a work if you have the permission. For this, you need to know who the copyright owner is and how to contact them to get that permission. Generally, it is the researcher's responsibility to contact copyright holders for permission to use their, their creation. In the case, the co in this case, the copyright owner is no. If in the case the copyright owner is no longer living, knowing when they passed away would help determine the date the copyright expires, which then puts it into public domain, which then allows anybody to copy it whenever. It is up to the individual researcher to ensure that they have the permission needed to use the co or copy copy the record. If they do not get permission to copy it will be the researcher who will be in violation of the Copyright Act. Copyright protection lasts the life of the creator plus 50 years after the death of the creator. The creator usually owns the copyright to the work except if they transfer or sell the copyright to someone else or if the work is commissioned by someone else where payment is made for the work and no agreement is stated um, regarding the ownership of that copyright. Once copyright expires, the records are part of what is called in the public domain, and they can be used by anyone without seeking permission. Generally, the following are not considered infringements of copyright. When you're quoting a few lines, uh, so long as you acknowledge the author, playing purchased CDs or DVDs at home, public performances of a public domain work like Shakespeare's play, obtaining permission to copy a work from the copyright owner. There is a section in the Copyright Act that is called Fair Dealing, and it states that a portion of a work may be copied without pertaining permission from the copyright holder if it is for research, private study, education, parody, satire, crit criticism, review, or news reporting. This important part to note is that only a portion may be copied and not a substantial part. And that's the key, understanding what substantial is. So only a little bit can be copied. And you have to cite the source, the author, and give uh, credit to the author. Um, although substantial is not defined in the legislation, it seems that it is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis in the courts. Section 30 of the Copyright Act is specifically aimed at libraries, archives, and museums. And, um, and, a, and a library, archives, and museum, according to in this instance, is defined as an eligible library, archive, or museum is one that is not established or conducted for profit, and not part of, not administered, and not directly or indirectly controlled by a body that is established or conducted for profit also the library, archives, and museum must hold and maintain a collection of documents and other materials that is open to the public or researchers. For this exception to apply, a copy can be made for maintenance or management of permanent uh, the permanent collections, whether they are published or unpublished, where the original is too fragile in, or in danger of being damaged or deteriorating by use where the format is being becoming obsolete, obviously in a digital format, for insurance purposes or police ins investigations, any rep reproduction of that work that are based on this exception must meet the following. Uh, only one copy can be provided to the researcher. The library, archives, and museum must inform the researcher that this copy is for research and private study only. <coughs> And, must have, um, and for any other use must have the permission of the copyright holder. The copyright must be a photocopy and it cannot be a scan and it cannot be in a digital format. And there must be no motive of gain. In addition to this, these exceptions, the regulation to the Copyright Act required that the library, archive, or museum must keep detailed records whenever it reproduces a single copy of a work for a researcher. So, although you're making these private, these copies for private use and study purposes, you need to know 
the library needs to have their name uh, recorded. If it's for an interlibrary loan purpose or interinstitutional inter loan purpose, who's the requesting institution? The date of the request, sufficient information um, where you can find the book, the article, the archive. So an ISBN N number, a locator number, volume number of a periodical, and, and so forth. So you, you have to know what you're finding, what you're copying, and the number of pages copied. This information must be kept in a readable way, in, some, in a way that you can quickly find it um, for three years so, so that the, the copyright owner who has a right to ask for this information can ask for it if they so choose. Also, if the archives has a... F uh -oh. I'm sorry, I'm a little behind here. Also, if the archives has a photocopier available for public or research uh, researchers to use on their own, um, you have to have a sign indicating that they may only use the photocopy for research and private study only. This is, uh, there is one special provision for archives um, that allows archives to copy unpublished works. Uh, for this provision to apply, the person who deposited the work must be notified that the work may be copied so long as the donor has pro not prohibited the copying of these records or copying has not been prohibited by other copyright owners. So, for example, if you, it, as the donor, have a letter from someone else and that person has said, you can't copy my letter to you, then you're stuck. Only uh, one copy of the work can be provided for research or private study, otherwise permission for the copyright owner is required. This applies not only to published works, but unpublished works, photos, moving image and sound rec recordings, and digital records as well. Any fees for copying uh, by the archives must be limited to cost recovery only. So you can't make money off of this. Uh-huh, okay. I guess I hit it too hard. So going on to access and privacy. The other half of the balancing act that the archivist must deal with is the issue of an individual's right to privacy. Privacy as a donor and privacy regarding information found in the records. Sometimes this may prove to be a bit difficult to navigate, given that one of the missions of the archivist is to provide access to the documentary heritage in their archives. On the other hand, the archivist has a responsibility to acknowledge an individual's right to privacy. Access legislation, unlike copyright legislation, puts the burden of responsibility in managing personal privacy issues in the holder of the information, therefore the arch archives, not the researcher. The archivist at the point of donation or clo as close to the donation as possible may assist the donor in clarifying any issues of privacy by outlining any legal restrictions on access or by identifying some ways of managing any privacy issues. Uh, when and how long the individual has a right to keep their lives private? Does the archives have a moral obligation to withhold access to archives if they believe that the information contained them in them is too personal or that the people in the records may adversely be affected if the records are made available? Okay, have to hurry. There is a general belief that information becomes less sensitive with time. It is accepted that, that a generation or two after death of the author is acceptable. That puts it into 25 to 30 years or 75 years after the record is created is also um, an option. A third way is a research agreement where the personal information is stripped uh, for publication, but this doesn't really work for biographical or historical type of, of uh, accounts. This limits access in the present, but allows access in the future. Access legislation, governments um, around the world in the European Union and in Canada have uh, put forward, that's okay, just, it's good, um, legislation to protect personal privacy in the use, collection, and disclosure of personal information. Um, the federal government um, has put forward uh, legislation, Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, 
Paipita, but has said that if a province enacts a similar leg piece of legislation, that legislation <coughs> provincially will apply. So Alberta has done that, and we have what is called the Personal Information Protection Act, and it applies to, uh, to the personal information that is being used, disclosed, and um, collected. Sorry. Uh, there are a number of exceptions that pertain to the archives which are helpful. The general rule of collection, use and disclosure, um, information outlined in legislation may be considered as good practices to follow for archives. Basically, the law identifies that the person should be aware that their personal information is being collected and for what purpose, how it's going to be used and for what purpose, how it will be disclosed. The individual giving consent has also the right to opt out of that at any point in time. Um, archives uh, that have personal information that were open and unrestricted <coughs> before this legislation coming into force has been allowed to continue that process. So these things are open and available if, if that's what the process was before. Also, if the donor has agreed to uh, their information being um, made public or allowed to be open uh, in an agreement, donor agreement, that also frees up the archives to, to uh, open up that information. In sections 14, 17, and 20 of the legislation in Alberta, um, archives may collect, use, and disclose personal information about an individual without the consent of that individual if the organization collecting, using, or disclosing the information is an archival institution and the collection, use, and disclosure of the information is reasonable for archival purposes. Um, and the meets the requirements respecting archival purposes or research set out in the regulations and is not res reasonable to obtain the con consent of the individual whom the, individu uh, the information is about. Man, these people who write legislation. <laughs> consent for collection, use, and disclosure can be obtained directly from the donor at the point of donation. And that's what is preferred. When you talk to the donor, let them know their information can be out there um, and are they okay with it? Otherwise you have to make an arrangement on how you're going to make that um, available or not. In conclusion, although there are rules on how to collect, use and disclose personal information in today's legislation and rules around the use of copyrighted records, the leg legislation does not disallow or close the records for use. Being aware of the legislation and how it impacts documentary heritage in an archive allows for conversations to take place at the point of donation, it allows for informed consent to collection, use, and disclosure and copying of records, keeping abreast of the changes in laws that are updated from time to time is also important as laws and regulatory requirements change. And they're looking at the copyright law currently um, to update it as well. And being aware of these rules and building them into donor agreements or procedures to accessing records minimizes issues later. Good record keeping of the use and disclosure and copying allows, um, also allows the archives to be transparent and manage the information in their archives, harmonizing the needs of the individual, donor, creator, and the, that of the researcher will continue to be a balancing act for archivists. The challenge for archivists and archives will remain to continue to keep the balance between making the, the records available for research and protecting the needs of the individual and donor. As laws change and as demands for more rigorous and transparent control of one's personal information increases in an age of ever-changing technology. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. So what I've got from all of this is not to trust technology in any way. <laughs> um, we have... Uh, we have just a couple minutes for questions before lunch. Uh, I mean, the law creates all kinds of problems, especially when we get intellectual property. Uh, in employment law, the full product of your labor belongs to the employer. And I ran into that as a university instructor myself. When I delivered a lecture at the University of Alberta, I could walk away with that lecture and it was still mine. When I wrote courses for Athabasca University, the product of my labor belonged to the employer, Athabasca University. So you run into employment law, and you have to ask questions like that when you collect documents, intellectual property, essentially. Yeah. Yes, you have to know who owns the Who property. is the owner? 
Right. Yeah. And that's, that was the whole point right at the beginning. You have to ask those questions. Sometimes um, in your employment agreement, you have to read the fine print where it says anything you create and, as an employee belongs to the company. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes not. Sometimes when you publish, you also have to pass on or transfer uh, copyright to the publisher so they can do their work. So, I mean, you have to, as, as a creator, you have to be aware of what your rights are, but also as an archivist, you have to ask those questions. And that's my point in understanding the law, knowing what you have, and the things that are intermingled, and who owns the copyright, so you can manage it. Because running to the donor or the creator every time somebody wants to access this is impossible. It's impossible. So you have to do your due diligence on that. Okay, just as a final note, under common law, it always belongs to the employer. Well, that, well that's, again, that was my point when I said if you're, if you're uh, hiring someone to create something for you, and if you don't say in your contract yeah. who owns it, the person who pays the bill owns the stuff. Oh, yeah, not quite. Um, does copyright law figure into uh, photos of archival material or even artifacts that are on display in an exhibit or a gallery? Good question. I, I'm not a lawyer, uh, so I can't, I mean, don't take my word as gospel. But making copies of things uh, is, you have to really make sure that you have the right to do that. So taking photographs of an art piece or taking photographs of documents, and whether it's photographs or photocopies, you're still making a copy. And if you don't have permission to do so, you're better off not allowing that. What do you do in instances where you are given access to an archive from somebody uh, that is later deposited in an archival collection and uh, you use it you have free use of it because they got to go it personally. I mean, I, 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 this is a problem for me because I, I acknowledge that it's, you know, the originals are available now in the provincial archives in Alberta, but I had access and was able to copy everything with the approval of the family. Well, whether it's in an archive or not, if the person has copyright, if they own the copyright, and you want to copy it, you should ask permission to do so. Um, to be safe, uh, Conversation should be documented, and he should say, he or she should say, you, you know, you, you have my, my permission to copy it. If you don't, then I mean, you have the right to to bits and pieces, making those available, right, in the fair dealing issue. But copying the whole thing, uh, and again, for not for profit, you can't profit off. I mean, that's the whole thing of copyright, right? It's the creator should be getting the credit and any monetary return, not somebody else who copied it. And, and that's kind of the base starting point for copyright. Yes, sir. I'd like to direct my question to Chris Jameson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the question I asked earlier to uh, my remember it, which is, okay, so I, I move on to Niagara and many records of as a general scientific society. Um, and we're not in a case where we'll say, well, this is unimportant, because this was a society founded in the 1890s, it's international. We're part of the record, you know, minor one, but we're part of the record. All our material is digital. Not that we have digitized, we have done some scan. But what do we do yeah. with a organization that now runs through email, posters that are never actually printed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, born digital records have the same issues as, as digitized records. Well, you still have to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, there isn't a single answer to that question, basically. That's very unsatisfying. I know that. Um, <laughs> But like there is no, there is no silver, silver bullet to fix all of this. Um, you have to decide what's appropriate for your organization. Um, I would suggest 
identifying what you do need to preserve and what is going to be kept forever versus the stuff that isn't. Um, if you have emails of people setting up a meeting, you probably don't need to keep those emails. Um, but if you know you have an email that's like, here is the meeting minutes of this huge, important annual meeting that made a lot of decisions about our direction and our whatever, you want to keep that record. Um, so distinguishing between like what's an archival record and what's a transitory record, um, which is just big fancy ways of saying like what has enduring value and what doesn't, um, is really important because every single thing that you digitally preserve takes resources and money and effort. And so you don't want to be preserving a bunch of stuff that doesn't need to be preserved because you're not going to keep it in the long term. Um, basically, like don't waste your time and energy on things that aren't going to be kept. Um, but yeah, after that, it's. I, I mean, I would really recommend donating it to an archive that has a good digital archiving program, which unfortunately is not currently a lot of places. Uh, it's barely any places. Um, but just, no, I know, I know. And like, this is a terrible answer. And it's a terrible answer because there is no answer. Um, because like, no one has really done this. No one's done this to scale. No one knows what to do yet. We're still figuring it all out. That's why I didn't have, like, use this software and do X, Y, and Z, because that doesn't seem to fix. Um, like here at the university where I am currently working on figuring out a program so that we can accept the records of the president who left two years ago um, because everything she had is digital and what do we do with, you know, 50 gigabytes of records that are a president of the university records, so like almost everything she ever did was a big decision making and has enduring value. What do we do? <laughs> um, sorry? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that is, uh, yeah, printing it has actually been a suggestion at various times. Things as a book copy, um, because they have, are more secure in the long term. Um, basically, we, we try our best. You want to, like, do those things, like, have standards, have naming structure standards, identify what records should be kept. Don't let people use 50 different file formats. Have standards. Be like, you have to use this thing, you have to use this thing. When you're leaving the organization, give us all of your records. Um, put it somewhere that's like a secure-ish place. But yeah, we can only do <laughs> No, I mean, if your organization has a server that you trust as your share drive or something, and that is where your records have been created in the first place, then that might not be a terrible place to be putting them later. You accept a certain amount of risk in digital records, and like there isn't a good, there isn't a good answer. Exactly. There isn't a single way of doing things. There's lots of approaches to it. Um, I'm not for hoping that CSIS or the Russians are hacking your stuff and storing it. <laughs> document what you've done. If you decide to say everyone has to use Google Sheets or like, um, you know, Google Docs for every single written record, write that down somewhere so that people know later what everything is and when and why, um, because having that information is super helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's always really iffy. I mean, as any, I'm sure all of you know from your personal experiences on your personal computers where you just, you know, erased a hard drive and thrown it out because you're like, well, I haven't used that in 10 years. I'm sure it's fine. What was on it? Do you know? Do you have any idea what you just threw out? Probably not. And most organizations don't either. And like the paper records, sometimes things get recycled that shouldn't have been. And like, that is life. We do not have every record ever created because that is, well, not possible. But like, that's life. And like, digital isn't fundamentally different than paper. It's just a different media. Um, but like, we don't have everything that should have been archived. There's plenty of stuff where people are like, do you have this huge decision that the university made? I know because, you know, here's a student newspaper article about it. Do you have all the decision making documents about that? And we have to be like, we don't because no one gave it to us. And then somebody left their job and then somebody else decided that filing cabinet would probably just be recycled. It would be fine. And then they just threw out that paperwork. And like, that happens all the time. And like, it sucks with that way. So there is my terrible answer to that question. <laughs> Okay. Oh, one, we have time for one more question. Um, I know there's no one answer, Krista, but 
but uh, my understanding is that the best format to put digital files in is PDF or PDFD. Am I headed in the right direction at all? Yeah, so. Um, Other than Word and Excel. Yeah, so for certain kinds of records, so for textual records, for example, um, PDF and PDFA are, PDFA is a PDF archive, technically is what the A stands for. Um, it is a really good option for things like that. It maintains the formatting, so you're not worried about that, like, is it a Word 95 or is it a, you know, Word 2008. Um, there are certain types of documents that might not be the best approach for, um, depending on how people use the record. So say you have a, a spreadsheet, for example, and this is something that was searchable and had formatting and had, you know, all of these divisions of cells, um, that's not going to be kept in a PDF. Meanwhile, for a textual document, if you're like, this should be, you know, we want the equivalent of a printout of this textual document, then a PDF is a great, a great uh, format option. What you're looking for in format options are things that are really common. The more common, the better. You want to try to avoid things that are proprietary. Um, there's certain software types that if that company goes under, everything will immediately get blocked and you just won't be able to open it anymore. Um, that's what happened with Corel, we're terrific, Corel went under, and all of a sudden every Corel document just can't be opened. Um, and so you want to avoid things like that. You want to use things that have multiple softwares that can open the same things, which is why PDF is great, because it's created by Adobe, but there's a lot of other softwares that can open it too, um, which is really key. So that's the type of things that you're looking for. You want to look for things that aren't locked down. You want to look for things that are really common, so there's a community behind it. Like, the world is invested in preserving Microsoft because 90% of business records are Microsoft. We care about Microsoft being able to be opened. Some weird niche products you might not be able to do anything about. There's some times that there's nothing you can do about that. Um, I don't know how many people here know anything about design and architectural drawing. A lot of that is done in a program called AutoCAD. AutoCAD files can only be opened by AutoCAD, which is a pay, private, for-profit software company. There's also nothing we can do that because it's the only software that exists for the um, So we want to do that as much as we can to use things that are, are really common and standard and, and can be opened by lots of different things, um, but sometimes we don't have a choice. Just quickly, and photos, would you say this JPEGs or TIFFs? Um, JPEG 2000 and uncompressed um, is, is great. TIFF is also great. Mostly you want to have an uncompressed or what's called a lossless compression which means that you're not condensing a bunch of stuff, you're just writing in shorthand. Um, but that's most important, is that every single time you compress something, you can't uncompress it later. Um, that information is gone, so you want to keep as much information as possible. <laughs> if, it was, if it was taken in a lossy JPEG format, that information never existed, so you can't lose it. But if it was taken in an uncompressed raw type of format, you don't want to lose information. So keep it Good, thank you very much. I think this is one of the reasons I'm happy to be here today is because it brings everyone together and we can ask questions. Um, I'm sure that the panelists will be more than happy to discuss things over lunch. Uh, and if not, please get a business card uh, from all the presenters and don't hesitate to, to ask those questions. Thank you. And as a token of appreciation to the panel, to the chair of the panel, and fight with the technology and, and timing. Thank you from all of us.